So good morning, Michael. How are you? I'm good. How are you today? All righty. Glad to have you on your call. Um, and let's see what I'm going to, I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to make you a co-host right off the bat. And then uh, in theory, uh, I can hand over to you, or if you'd like, I can just drive your presentation uh, from here. Uh, I, probably instead of me telling you when to click, it's I'll, I can just run it, it's fine. Okay, <laughs> that, that'll be our backup, okay. Well, good. Uh, well, we're just at the top of the hour, so uh, let's get started. Uh, first off, thanks everyone for joining us uh, today. Uh, this is the Hyperledger Healthcare Special Interest Group. Uh, we're, we're thrilled to have uh, Michael Marchand as our guest speaker. Uh, but as always, uh, I want to get started uh, with a couple of uh, administrative things. Uh, first and foremost, we are recording this, and so just keep that in mind uh, going forward. As well, uh, and this is true for all aspects of uh, Hyperledger, we do have an antitrust slide, and you see that up on the display. Uh, and uh, feel free to read through that, but the upshot of that, of course, is uh, just be a good person. So uh, that's that's what I will say to that. And there's a URL if you feel free, if you, if you feel engaged to, to sort of dig into that, feel free to parse that uh, a little more specifically. Um, we do have, I think, a couple of new folks on the call. Uh, we usually like to have uh, any new members or people that are visiting uh, just introduce themselves if you feel comfortable in doing so. Uh, so I'll just open it up. Uh, anyone on the call would like to introduce themselves and talk a little bit about their uh, their background, uh, professional background, and their interest in using hyperledger technologies to solve problems in healthcare. Um, hi, Jim Mason here, and I've been on this group before, um, but I'm from it for a while uh, due to work. But uh, now that you move the time to 10 a.m., it makes it easier to attend. Um, oh, great and, to have you, Jim. Yeah, and the focus I have has always been hyperledger primarily around fabric, although they're supporting projects as well. And then uh, I, I really work more in the automotive space, but I did a comparison with sort of our problems uh, around data management, privacy, and all that. And it has about a 95% overlap with healthcare as well. So it's always worth tracking what's going on on the healthcare side because we have the same, most of the same issues. Um, insurance, payments, uh, privacy, all that kind of stuff. Um, so anyway, that's why I'm here. Thanks. Great, great to have you, Jim. And I, yeah, I do recognize your name and, uh, and great to have you on the call again. Uh, thanks for that. Uh, anyone else uh, that's new to the call? Want to talk a little bit about yourself? Nobody else? Okay, and, and I suspect we'll have folks uh, getting on the call as, the, uh, as we get into the hour here. Uh, I, I do want to say a good morning to Erica Bierbauer. She's, she's our vice chair for, for the uh, uh, Hyperledger SIG. Uh, good morning, Erica. How are you? Good morning, Rich. I'm great. How are you? Uh, good. Uh, you're out of uh, Colorado, I think? Yes, Denver. And how much snow on the ground? I thought there was, you had snows in the foothills. We got about a foot. It's melting now, but yeah, we, there's still quite a bit of snow on the ground. Ah, tis the season. Good. Glad, glad, glad to see you on the call. Thanks. Glad to be okay. here. Okay. Uh, anyone else on the call want to say hello? All righty. Uh, well, a couple other things. Uh, if you are new uh, or you haven't already participated, uh, we do have a membership directory, so feel free to participate in that. Uh, what you'd want to have is your uh, Linux ID uh, to be able to get to this page and edit it directly. Uh, it's a great way to sort of connect with other members on uh, in the special interest group. Uh, as well, if you have, ever have questions, we have a, spe uh, we have a FAQ, an FAQ, and so uh, feel free to walk that if you've got questions. Or uh, as always, uh, you know, you can contact me. Uh, we also keep a list listserv, as you probably already know. Uh, and, uh, and also chat, uh, which is uh, uh, through Rocket Chat. Uh, and again, that's a great way to keep in touch with uh, members sort of in real time. Well, uh, with, uh, oh, and I, I did want to mention, um, we do have community announcements. Uh, primarily, uh, we have our Hyperledger Global Forum happening. Uh, that's happening next, early next year in March. That's in Phoenix, Arizona. Uh, and we're in the process of uh, trying to put something together for this uh, HC SIG form, uh, this, this group particularly, uh, and we're working on, on that at the moment. Uh, I, 
uh, at least several members are trying to uh, to get speaking engagements uh, queued for this, so their proposals are out. Uh, this is our annual Global Forum, and uh, again, it's going to be centered around Hyperledger specifically, and so all things Hyperledger, which to us should mean all things blockchain technologies, uh, and of course, we have our interest in, in the healthcare space. Uh, so feel free to take a look at that and it'd be great to see you at that Phoenix event early March of next year. Uh, and if I'm thinking correctly about a week or so later is the HIMSS conference. So uh, it's gonna be a busy March for some of us. Okay, well, uh, I'm, I'm thrilled to have uh, Michael Marchand from uh, UC Davis Health uh, joining us this morning. Uh, I. I think it was actually a HIMSS uh, sponsored webinar that I attended uh, where Michael was speaking, I wanna say maybe June, July timeframe. And I thought uh, he'd be a great uh, uh, person to join us uh, uh, for the sake of uh, HC SIG membership to talk a little bit more about uh, the work that he's doing in the healthcare space as it relates to a broader spectrum of interest, which is uh, health information exchanges, uh, and, uh, well, I'll say HL7, I think, you, uh, Michael, you touch on some fire issues, and then we'll talk a little bit about uh, sort of your view on how blockchain technologies might have influence on some of these uh, sort of day-to-day -day technologies that we deal with as they relate to HIEs and interoperability in general. Um, so, uh, first of all, good morning, Michael. Thanks for joining us. Good morning. Uh, and it's feel free- to be here. Yeah, and feel free. Do you want to just sort of take over, uh, take over the screen? Uh, sure. And I think you should be able to sort of pick it up from here. Uh, and again, yeah, if we have any te technical issues, we have our backup in place, so we're good to go. Um, are you giving me uh, com control, Rich, or am I? I'm asking for control, but it's telling me uh, you're you're rejecting it. So. Oh well, that's odd. Uh, do it one one more time because it should. I, I got an okay. Well, here I'll make you a host and see if that works. Okay. So so you are officially host at this point. All right. Still not letting me change the view to my, you know, let me see this. All right. Now there let me know go. if you can see my title slide. Yep. All right, great. Gotcha. Appreciate it. Well, I I'm, I'm appreciate your time this morning and I'm, I'm happy to share my insights uh, and perspective on uh, health information exchange and where I think blockchain is a, uh, a great technology and a good fit for especially use cases today where we don't do very well with exchange. So my presentation today really is just going to kind of go through um, the current state of exchange and health information exchange. I don't, don't really know what the framework or background of the of the audience was. So I, I've got some intro slides to just kind of explain health information exchange as it exists today and some of the standards and frameworks that we're using to do that exchange. Um, and then I go into some of the use cases around things that I'm aware of with blockchain and then one specific use case that I'm very, I'll call passionate about around patient mediated exchange and how blockchain might be able to not only allow for that capability to happen, but also help with the leveraging of consent, the consent models that are available and some of the other things that blockchain will do that uh, again are limited in the current way exchange happens today. Um, so as opposed to, I'm not going to read through. I think you have that on the, <coughs> excuse me, I've got a little bit of a cough. Uh, my extensive background, again, not reading through it all, but the biggest piece uh, for this group is that I'm on the HIMSS blockchain task force that's chaired by David Holding from Microsoft and Heather Flannery from Consensus. We have regular meetings and, and are creating publications to kind of to help give the healthcare industry some guidance and some background on blockchain and the technology and really help shape the HIMSS uh, I'll say HIMS opinion or HIMS membership around where the best use of the blockchain is and, and how to move forward with the technology and the organization. Um, I've been in Sacramento for over 25 years. Uh, I was with Sutter for about 12 in a similar role as the director of integration and uh, that I am here at UC Davis. Um, a little bit about UC Davis Academic Medical Center. So we have uh, the hospital here in Sacramento. We have a medical school where we're training physicians and clinicians 
and we also have a, a large research arm. So we have a significant amount of R&D work that we do that uh, we're looking at blockchain as, as possible solutions, especially around research and research consent. It's nothing that we're doing today, but part of my responsibility at Davis is to make sure as new technologies, especially technologies that exchange data, come into practice, uh, that we're familiar with the technology and, and understand as vendors show up with solutions, how we might implement that with our with our technologies. Um, again, I'm just going to go through the from a, a, a agenda standpoint overview of the current interoperability options and states and standards. Um, one of the hot uh, this is a, an industry joke, but the hot topics around exchange and healthcare is Fire, which is fast healthcare interoperability resources. So you'll hear a lot of Fire based jokes. It's essentially a, a move industry wide to more web open web API exchange than what's happening today. Um, it's pretty nascent. Uh, there's a, uh, some leading organizations that are doing it, but but it's not pervasive as of yet. Um, a majority of the exchange that happens today with more with, is with more of the older technologies and exchange standards, but we'll be seeing a, a large growth of that, and I'll talk about that a little bit. And then we'll talk through some of the blockchain pieces that I'm aware of, some of the use cases, um, and, and give people a, real, a, a good perspective of what I, again, my opinion on, on where blockchain fits in best. Um, so really what I wanted to do, again, just some level setting, health information exchange. Um, for, for us, there's kind of what I'll look at it as too, is there's a noun, there's a health information exchange as a company. So you'll have, there's probably 50 or 60 of these throughout the United States. In California, I think we have 20 or so health information exchanges from the San Diego Beacon community. Um, Santa, Ru Santa Cruz, Redwood MedNet, uh, Lanes, uh, LA Exchange in, in Orange County, Manifest MedX. Essentially, these are organizations that are stood up to connect a community. They create a centralized hub. Everybody feeds into the hub and the hub feeds out to the, to the community. There's also health information exchange, which I call the verb, which is the action of exchange, which is what we do here at Davis. So we're not connected to a noun. We're not connected to a health information exchange company, but we leverage the national networks and standards to connect with physicians and clinicians in our community and, and exchange norm, north of a million records a month outside of our of the four walls of our organization. Um, and essentially part of this is just making a decision of how how technically competent is your organization? Can you actively pursue deploying those standards or do you need help? How do you create the point-to-point -point solutions or do you need to have a hub that creates those for you and can you support them? Um, from a national exchange standpoint, there's multiple national networks today that, that we're connected to. Uh, eHealth Exchange is a national network that's handled, handled by the Sequoia Project. If you're familiar with at all with the, with the uh, legislation, the TEFCA legislation, 21st Century Cures, the Sequoia Project has actually been uh, tapped as the coordinating entity for creating a national network of exchange. Um, they currently, provide oversight and governance around the eHealth Exchange, which connects the government entity, Social Security, VA. Um, it also provides us a, an access or a port to connect with Dignity Health and DaVita. Then there's also another national network that was spun up, um, again, by providers and caregivers and vendors called Care Equality. Um, it leverages the uh, IHE profile to do exchange for clinical context documents. Uh, it's a query and re request and respond type network, similar to Commonwealth. Essentially, there was a VHS slash a beta kind of paradigm here with this, these exchange networks. Care quality was more of the VHS, probably a little more homogenized across the, the industry. Commonwealth might have been a little bit better model, but it wasn't quite as well adopted, so that's your beta. Um, and at this point, uh, all the national networks are moving forward with the care quality model and exchange framework. So. You'll hear Commonwealth talk about them being a care quality implementer. Same thing with eHealth Exchange, they're a care quality implementer. So if you're connected with one of those networks, you're connected across the industry as, from an exchange standpoint. And then direct is a standard that's been out for a long time. It was part of the meaningful use measures back in 2010. And essentially it's a secure email protocol that allows clinicians and provi providers to exchange information using a push methodology as opposed to the query respond. Um, and it gives gives people a little more flexibility of what documents they exchange and how they exchange them. Um, so from a from an organization standpoint, you know what you have to do is figure out what your needs are, 
how do you how do you leverage those standards? What do you what do you want to do? And that kind of gives you some idea of what standards that you want to implement. Is it physician to physician, physician to patient, insurer? Um, how will the data be consumed? Is it discrete or not discrete? And part of the reason I'm going through this is really that's the same sort of of mindset as you look at a blockchain use case of who's the consumer? How will they consume the information? Um, blockchain as a technology is very good at, at a federated data model where you have uh, multiple endpoints with data sets that are, are somewhat shared across that, that entire federation. And so understanding how a consumer, let's just say a patient, how would a patient plug into a consortium, a blockchain consortium, or what would be their, their leverage point or their fulcrum point to get access to or, or the ability to provide consent to data, right? So when you're looking at blockchain solutions, you're looking at who is the person, who are the people that are going to administrate it, who are going to be the, the contributing to that those records, who's going to pro provide access to the chain, um, and what types of data do you, do you store on chain? So what I've done here is just kind of given you a sense of what standards apply for these particular uh, you know, use cases today, whether it's provider to provider, consumer, or insurer, and which ones are supported throughout the industry. Um, from an HL7 standpoint, so HL7 is the standards body that def has defined most of the standards relating to exchange today. Uh, uh, essentially, a pipe delimited ASCII text where they, the HL7 organization went through, they identified trigger events and things that essentially as you go through an activity in an electronic health record, what information do you want to exchange and how you'll exchange it. And they created a, a specification that identifies segments, fields, essentially the data elements that would go in based on the event that occurred in the software. So from a, a, a ADT, so what you're seeing on the screen is an, is an ADT is a patient demographic transaction. It means admit, discharge, or transfer. So that's a function in the hospital if a patient's admitted. Then you have a transaction, which is AO1. And then the message that you see at the bottom of the screen or the format, essentially as you're looking at the MSH segment, that's the message header, it'll tell you what the transaction and transaction types are. As you see in the little circle, this is ADT AO1. That's the event type. And that lets the consuming side of the transaction know what data is coming, what event occurred, and understands the standards and segments that are applied. This is a pervasive, the currently, uh, the current and, and most pervasive way, version two, so here V2 HL7, that's most of the exchange happening within organizations today in healthcare. So if I'm trying to send patient demographic information, order information, results information between uh, systems inside my organization or even outside of my organization, this is probably the most pervasive standard that we have today. Uh, I have a, a V2 interface that I implemented at Sutter in the 90s that's probably still running today. So. Uh, part of this transition and, and from an industry standpoint to more federated data sets, uh, request and response, and some of the more web API standards are things that are starting to be adopted, but it's going to be a long time before this version and standard is retired. Uh, version 3, version 3 was an effort to remodel the transaction sets kind of back in the 90s. Um, the one that adopted it the most heavily was our uh, pharmacy uh, modules. So if you hear about ShareScripts, which is the national organization that handles electronic prescribing, they implemented a V3 standard for that prescribing methodology. So if you if a provider creates a, a prescription, sends it off to a pharmacy, the messaging standard that's leveraged through that is usually V3. Uh, it have, has heavy adoption in Europe, not a lot of adoption here in the States. Again, mostly because of some of the care models and some of the uh, infrastructure and things in place. Um, part of meaningful use was to was to facilitate document exchange. So you'll see clinical document architecture or a CCD, a clinical continuity a continuity of care document, and essentially that's the document that gives a, a full <coughs> excuse me gives you a full um, range of information for a particular transaction set. So if you have a history and physical or a discharge summary or uh, a particular document that gets created in the in the EHR from a care interaction. The old standard didn't quite provide enough framework to capture all that. So this standard supports the new, the, a newer way of exchange, a more full exchange that allows providers to, to give us a, a more of a summary of care as opposed to a specific item of care like a radiology result or a prescription or an order or patient demographic information. 
And most of the exchange that happens between organizations today across those national networks is a CCD document that has a problems, meds, allergies, advanced directives, and some clinical notes embedded in those transaction sets. These are all uh, you know, XML-based transactions that you'll see the tagging, so you can human-readable format that you'll see uh, in that exchange frame. Uh, and again, just to give you another opportunity to kind of see how what the setup and the markup is for these transaction sets, um, it's pretty straightforward. It was really kind of the first move by HL7 to a more of a web standard, um, you know, as opposed to <coughs> excuse me, as opposed to a de facto or, or custom standard that they created. Um, so from an industry standpoint, you're he you hear a lot of of talk about AI and NLP and, and machine learning. Um, I think that the the <clears throat> conceptually, the amount of data in healthcare that get created and exchanged, we have what I call a, a very much a redundant data strategy. We take the same information, copy it across for multiple organizations and systems. So the idea of federation, again, a consortium, um, is really something that needs to be looked at because we we are copying and we don't we're, we essentially don't know what the source of truth is anymore. So with this a significant amount of data increase and everything being electronic, leveraging these tools can help provide a little more insight to clinicians to, to overlay some of these technologies over the significant data sets. We're starting to see some inroads, mostly in research today, but I think that as those research uh, use cases bear some fruit, you'll see some of those AI and, and NLP uh, capabilities being wrapped into your EHR technology and helping the clinician who's in front of the patient uh, sort through the mountains of data that might be in a patient chart and provide some a better insight into that large data set during a care transaction. Um, the FHIR standard, um, again, part of the concept with FHIR is that it's unlocking the data. So historically, the EHR vendors have had their data in their database and it's been very difficult to get out. A lot of the regulations have essentially required the vendors to make web APIs available. FHIR is the standard that HL7 has, has created that it gives people some framework around what those transactions and transaction sets look like. Obviously, blockchain, um, there, there's getting more and more of, of a footprint in healthcare of organizations that are doing blockchain use cases. <clears throat> a lot around pharmacy, uh, supply chain, and directory services. At least those are the ones that I've run into that are actually that people are actually doing, and I'll talk about that a little bit. Um, and then patient mitigated or mediated exchange. Again, looking for something where a patient has access and control. And I think this again is where blockchain can come in if if we have the right framework uh, and the right UI that a patient can engage and can and manage their the access to their record, um, provide consent to different organizations and different use cases for for their information. And again, the use case I have at the end will kind of walk through at least my vision of what that might look like. So this is a, a, a graph that just talks to you about the different standards. So I've talked about B2 HL7, that's your kind of teal line there, the adoption. And as, as we move forward, it, the, the, there are less and less of those being implemented. You've got the CDA, uh, the purple line there. Um, that's really, again, kind of tied in with meaningful use and the, the significant adoption curve essentially to get the meaningful use dollars that were, were farmed out in the healthcare industry. Uh, V3, similar. And then as you can see the timeline moving forward, you see those HL7 fire integrations. So the projection is, is these web APIs are really gonna become the pervasive exchange standard within healthcare. Um, again, hype cycle, I think you probably, everybody's probably seen the Gartner hype, hype cycle. I just share this, cause this is from 2017, specifically around different technologies. If you look kind of on the downslope of the curve as we head to the trough of disillusionment, uh, blockchain is kind of falling into the is falling into that. And I, I think that there's, after all the hype, I was at a HIM session uh, two years ago and it was standing room only for a room of 400 about just kind of general concepts in healthcare around blockchain and healthcare. Um, I think that there's some disillusionment as, as solutions have come to the industry or have come to market and been presented to different organizations, there's a lot more skepticism about what the value proposition is for an organization like UC Davis to implement a, a blockchain solution without a consortia. Um, is there, wh where is the, the value in having a blockchain solution to, to you know, secure my devices in a particular, in my, in my organization, as opposed to leveraging, again, that, that federated data set? So 
you'll see more of that. Uh, I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, just a little bit more about the the fire, the fast healthcare interoperability resource. It really is the hot they have <laughs> the hot fire that's happening in healthcare. I apologize for all the puns. I hear them all and they just get stuck in my head. Um, but just to give you a little more information on that, there's also something called Smart on Fire, which is essentially an out of the box app that leverages the technology. So you'll hear about far, Smart on Fire applications where people have built <coughs> application functionality on top of the web APIs that provide additional decision support or, or UI to pulling data out of the EHR and making it uh, available to clinicians, whether that be a physician growth chart or something else that's a lot more, I'll call it cool technology or, or a cool view of the data sets that the historical EHR vendors haven't provided. Um, one of the cool use cases is Apple HealthKit. So if you have a little heart on your phone, if you're familiar with HealthKit, HealthKit leveraged the, the fire standards and actually, or Apple leveraged the fire standards and actually has allowed us to plug our EHR into your phone. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so by leveraging that standard, we actually have been able to download our medical records and provide patients with the ability to actually pull in their allergies, their medications, their immunizations, their lab results, and, and handle them on their phone and actually share them. So if you haven't done that or if your organization doesn't, hasn't, isn't supported that, supporting that standard, that's one of the ways that we're doing the exchange. Now, one of the things that's missing here is consumer education. So now that I have this information on my phone, what's my security risk? What's, what can I do with it? How does that help if I have an emergency and I'm in a different state? How do I provide access to this information to another provider? So there's still a lot of, of education to be done to consumers on, on what the value of having this information on your phone. Everybody just wants their data. This is a, a, a pretty easy way from a, a UC Davis standpoint or from a provider standpoint of giving consumers access to their data, putting it on their phone. And, and personally, I think that, that most of the transactions that we have or the interactions we have with, with patients and consumers will move towards mobile if it hasn't moved already. And the more that you can facilitate an ease of that transaction set, the better off your organization or the better set you are for, for success. Uh, so one of the other pieces with the new TEFCA and 21st Century Cures reg regulations are what types of data sets. So you might say, well, what, what information can I pull out of an EHR with a fire transaction set? This list gives you a pretty good uh, overview of the types of information that's, that's going to be available through those fire APIs. Um, some, as you can see on the provenance one, is a, is a little bit of a future piece. Uh, it's not available today. It's at least with the EHR technology that we're using but it gives you a sense of what kind of information can you pull, what kind of transaction can you pull out of your EHR. One of the things, so, so one of the, the, I'll call it white spaces in healthcare is the interoperability between payer and provider. Fire is attempting to try to solve some of that with, with the, what's called the Da Vinci Project. So it's a number of insurers that have come together to help define the, the transaction sets and standards for insurers communicating with, with providers. So for data quality and exchange for our ATO or medical home model, uh, there's a lot of exchange of data for quality measures that help improve the contract rates or the reimbursement for providers that shows that they're managing their patient population. Today, most of that happens through fixed uh, you know, CSV files and uploads and downloads. There's not a lot of real-time transaction sets between the, the uh, health insurers and the providers for these things. So this, uh, this organization is trying to move towards a more real-time exchange framework for not only quality measures, but uh, authorizations. That's another problem spot for healthcare organizations is, is when does a patient need authorization based on their health plan, um, based on their, you know, what, their, what they've been contracted for with our organization versus a different organization. There's a lot of layers to that onion that make authorizations a, a lot more difficult and the transaction's quite not as standard. Some things need additional clinical data. Some things just need a provider. Some things just need the insurance company to sign off on. So the Da Vinci Project is really kind of walking through those use cases and helping facilitate on the FHIR API standards those exchange frameworks to help move from a batch, uh, antiquated batch exchange process that we're in today to a more real-time web API-based exchange framework. 
this just gives you a sense of who's involved right now. It's very payer and vendor heavy. Uh, if you look kind of at the bottom, you've got Cedars, you've got Sutter Health, um, and a couple other organizations. We've just signed up to be a partner to develop some of those standards with our HealthNet uh, partner. We're also an Epic shop, so Epic is moving along with those, those guidelines, and we, we use InterSystems as our middleware. They're also a sponsor here, so we're in the right place with the technology to try to advance some of this uh, at our organization. So now I'm just going to talk a little bit about blockchain. Again, you most of you probably know a lot more than I do. I, I'm talking to you from the frame or the lens that I that, that I come at at it from, um, just to give you a sense of what I'm familiar with through my work at Hims, um, and and again my opinions on on kind of how where blockchain is going to fit in. I don't think you need an overview of what blockchain is. Um, here's the blockchain hype cycle. So so now blockchain on the previous hype cycle in 2017 was one dot on the Gartner. Uh, block that kind of showed us moving into the trough of disillusionment. Now, if you look, we've got a whole a whole Gartner hype cycle for blockchain and the different iterations of blockchain. Uh, blockchain and healthcare is moving up the up up the <coughs> up the uh, to the top. You got smart contracts. You got blockchain and insurance. So so again, you can tell that if Gartner's got a whole hype cycle dedicated to blockchain and blockchain technologies. The technology is here to stay and it's got a footprint. Now it's kind of, especially in healthcare, is what are the right use cases? How do you leverage the technology and really to bring the value of consortia to a community um, so that you can see that value? Because right now in the, in, the, in the vendors that have come and talked to me about implementing blockchain solutions, they've come to me with point solutions and it's, and it's hard for me to reconcile whether that's a, a better way than what we have today. If there's a consortia or there's, if there's five or six organizations in my community that are willing to leverage a shared data model, um, then that might be value, especially around provider credentialing and some other use cases that I'm familiar with. Uh, healthcare related blockchain projects. Again, this is a slide that I pulled off, uh, off online for this presentation, just to give you a sense of who's out there that's doing blockchain related projects. Um, some of the use cases. So in this deck, I've linked you to the HIM, HIM website. Um, we've got digital identity management, which is essentially for, for me, the, the use cases are provider directory use cases. So Synaptic Health is a, is a provider, a payer provider kind of consortium that's pulling together Humana and a number of organizations to, to look at how to put provider directory information on blockchain. Hashed Health has a similar model, uh, their ProCredit solution and SimBlock. Um, those are organizations that are, again, I think digital identity is the tag that, that HIMSS has given to it. Uh, for, for me, this is these companies are providing uh, provider directory solutions. So if you think about this uh, in the Sacramento market, uh, we have a, a group of providers that are independent that get credentialed at either organization. To credential a provider to provide care at our health organization, we've got to confirm their license, we've got to track their DEA number, we've got to get their NPI, got to get insurance information and all of us in Sacramento have to do that same piece of work for credentialing a provider at organization. These models actually take that and make that data federated so that if I confirm a license, I can put that confirmation on chain, I can make it available to the community and that way another organization doesn't have to go through the two week wait to get that licensing information. They can see that it's on chain, that it's verified. Um, I'm still working through in my own head what the um, compliance or, or risk is on leveraging data on chain that's been provided by another organization. I think we still got some ways to go from a regulation standpoint, because um, if I allow a, a, a provider to, to practice medicine in my organization based on information from somebody else and they're not actually licensed because something got messed up, what's my liability there? So. Um, I think that there's uh, some some good value. I think that this is a, a good use case because it is the same information. Still think that there's some things to work out in the legal and compliance area. Clinical research, uh, access and, and monetization. Again, I think this is providing consent and consent management, um, putting information out there that allows uh, researchers to, sh to share information across large data sets and large enterprises. Um, I included some of the uh, companies or projects that I'm from or that were on, again on the HIMSS website for you to take a look at but that gives you a sense that uh, pharmaceutical supply chain is one area where I see some traction in, le in leveraging blockchain and blockchain technologies. 
And then standard supply chain, um, you've got, uh, you know, essentially data. I, I mean, I think you've all are familiar with Walmart putting lettuce uh, that in their supply chain on blockchain <laughs> to, to manage it or to track it from field to the store. Um, so I think supply chain is a use case. Again, and talking with the people here at UC Davis, we haven't seen any vendors show up. We do buy a lot of our pharmacy supplies or pharmaceuticals from a, from a kind of resellers or wholesalers. So we're not getting it from the manufacturer traditionally. Um, so again, it's not something that we've seen, but again, this gives you a sense of that. And then financial records, uh, payment processing, you got Change Healthcare and Tibco, um, essentially just looking at how payments and payment processing happens in industry and some use cases where people are doing it. And again, it's not something that I've seen or, or am familiar with here. Uh, this slide just gives you a sense of the 50 plus blockchain real world use cases. Again, some of them are in healthcare, some of them are in different different areas. Um, this is one I thought was interesting that came across my Twitter feed where it was a blockchain for emergency medic, uh, emergency response. Um, so we've got in California here, we've got we've had a lot of fires recently, people displaced uh, by the fires. And so is there a, a way to leverage the blockchain solution for some of the things that are going to be needed in, a, in an emergency and let, letting people know and, and verifying that. So this was uh, an interesting use case, that, again, that came across my feed, but I thought based on what's happening in California, this is something that would be very important to somebody that's in one of those areas that's been affected by the fires. Um, so then this is where we get into uh, Mike's version of what I think uh, patient-mediated exchange and self-sovereign identity might be a really good place for blockchain to fit in and a blockchain solution. Uh, you know, I think of it as a longitudinal health record track and trace, because right now you don't really know, uh, for me as a healthcare provider, I don't know all the places that a, a patient has received care and I can't always confirm their identity. And one of the things I'm showing here in the slide is how many identities a patient may even have from their insurance company to their physician, uh, pharmacy, if they've changed insurances, they might have different providers and pharmacies. And then when you look through that, how many different identi identity or identification numbers do they have? You got driver's license, you got social security. Every company that you engage with provides you with a customer number. So you've got an insurance number for each insurance company. Each physician probably gives you a medical record number. You might have a different number at the pharmacy. So again, it just kind of gives you a sense of when you talk about managing identity and knowing who somebody is from encounter to encounter, it's very difficult to, as much as, as the industry has tried to do that with algorithms and matching algorithms and, and sophisticate, making them even more and more sophisticated, it's still not 100%. Um, so if you looked at this and said, well, what if I could, lever what if Paul and his family could create their own identity, leveraging self-sovereign identity, and that could be consumed by a blockchain and then provided to the healthcare providers and organizations as their true identity. Um, you know, the concept of digital twins or digital identities is, is fairly commonplace, or at least in the things that I interact with. Um, you know, I, I've got a, I might have a gamer tag for any time I do games versus my social media uh, presence. So the concept of having blockchain and a self-sovereign identity for my health identity seems like a relatively straightforward and consumer friendly idea here, right? So if I, if I have an identity chain and I can have that consumed by the organizations, what you're seeing on the screen is the, the green block just says, okay, I've created an identity, there's an identity chain. And as I um, interact with these different organizations, one through four, they consume that identity. And so now there's a very true and real knowledge that I am, uh, the true customer is who they are, and there's an ability to know where I've had care, right? So um, so that way I can, in this particular example, I can leverage the existing uh, exchange frameworks that I talked about before, care quality, e-health exchange, the Commonwealth network, and that way anytime that there's an exchange, I've got a patient match, and now I can ex leverage those existing frameworks to exchange that clinical data. And based on what I understand is that uh, heavy, long, large data sets aren't very, isn't the right use case for, for blockchain, right? I'm not gonna put an entire encounter or one of those V2 transactions or those CCD documents on chain, but I could put some summary piece of information, some subset of that, hash that, 
put that on chain that gives me the breadcrumb back to, the, to that full information. So, you know, that's kind of the, the first la layer of the idea. <clears throat> and then the second layer of the idea is that we now move forward and have what I call the encounter chain. So now not only are the organizations consuming my identity, but now as I have each transaction, I, I put that breadcrumb on chain. So in, the, in, in essence, what I'm providing is the ability to track and trace across the longitudinal, my longitudinal health record where I've had care. Essentially, I don't, I don't know that I always remember where I've been. There might be interactions where I haven't. So I'm, I'm relying on a consortium to be writing those things on chain, but at least I've provided the infrastructure to say, here's my identity, here's where I've had care, and then maybe leveraging, again, those existing frameworks again to pull that longitudinal record back together. So at the end, what you've got is you've got the ability to take all that information, all those different encounters, and then pull it back together in a, a fairly straightforward, and again, I've got a, a patient portally UI on the right, but that frame or what that looks like is really up to the solution providers and what they want and what consumers want and how flexible your technology is. Um, and this is just, uh, again, uh, David Holding is somebody I've worked with a lot. He wrote an article that kind of, uh, the article I link at the bottom really summarizes some of the ideas that I just had about uh, or, or shared about the uh, the encounter chain and kind of taking taking the, the longitudinal record and leveraging blockchain for more of an identity and track and trace model. And, and essentially, this is just a, a blockchain representation of that common data set and what that common data set that's shared or that's kept at each organization independently. So as you can see, organization A, B, and C, they've got private data and they've got common data. Well, instead of all of them storing that common data, you move to the right and you've actually put the common data on chain and made that uh, available from a community resource standpoint. So in the presentation, you'll see a lot of links that'll take you out the different information or where I've pulled some of this this thing. And again, a lot of this is, is uh, information that I've gathered from my experience and, and from working with really smart people uh, on that HIMSS blockchain task force. So at this point, I'm happy to answer any questions if there's any anybody has anything. Hi, uh, Jim Mason. Um, I, I'm the guy from the automotive world. And this is exactly as you walk through it, why I pay attention to healthcare. Because minus differences, the differences in regulation are, I believe they're not small, not large. And the differences in data formats are obvious, but minus that, everything else you walk through, um, I'm actually working on all the same stuff in what we call the mobility space. So we have all the same problems, pretty much technically to deal with for sure. Um, what I can tell you is looking at this thing more on the technical side is that <laughs> you talk about the trough of disillusionment. So I'll, I'll get everybody right to the bottom of the trough. There's not going to be one network for any of this, um, and we've discovered that in the mobility space. So one of the major challenges, of course, is interoperability between networks. And so we've started focusing on that in the mobility um, mapping, if you will, that we have to upfront support multiple blockchains uh, for things like identity, um, in your case, encounters, all that stuff. Um, the other thing that sticks out that's big, um, which is an issue that's not fully resolved the way it needs to be to be effective. There's really three types of information for a transaction when you quote, put it on the network that includes a blockchain. Number one, you pointed out, you have the transaction identity. You know, if, if I took, uh, if I ordered a prescription, there's a transaction for that in the HL7 framework or the FIRE framework, I guess. And you'd say, okay, that transaction has an ID, Type and ID, and it also on the blockchain would have a proof. So all of that stuff be on the blockchain. But you're right, the actual private data about who I am and all that other stuff is flowing as your diagram showed through the private data network, the way you laid it out. But there's a third part to this, which is tougher, and that's the fact that there's a whole other data layer of large data, not small data. And so it's not just about who I am as a patient and that kind of stuff, but you've now got the associated, in my case in radiology, I've got the uh, images and all that other stuff. And I have to have links to that, whether it's a third party service I'm getting it from, or as you pointed out earlier, in these distributed networks, we're trying to share the stuff across, not maybe not the whole network, but at least maybe from the 
uh, provider to the insurance company um, and so on, uh, whoever's involved and whoever needs it. So there's a lot of complexity around getting this right on the implementation side. And the biggest thing, I guess, at this point is challenging the happy assumptions that a lot of the larger players have that like, ooh, look, I'll, I'll own this. No one entity is gonna own any part of it, actually. It's all gonna come down to standards and interoperability, you know, from our point of view, both on healthcare and on um, mobility as well. Yeah, and and I mean, you make a good point, and it's something that, uh, that I'm not, again, very educated on, but, when you talk about not everything's going to be on one chain <clears throat> or one solution stack is what's the capability or ability of organizations that are on different ones. So let's just, if you look at the patient model, right, and I've got media exchange and I deal with different organizations with different solutions, what, what's the capability or possibility at some point in the future that you can at least reference or have a cross reference between Hyperledger and Ethereum and whatever, or, or is somebody working on that interoperability today? And, and I, again, I'm not aware of it. But. So the argument, so the good news is there are there are already solutions in other domains that do exactly that. So there's things like in the security space, you have something called single sign-on that under the covers uses something called Kerberos. In Kerberos, you actually do upload a mapping of different, um, in a sense, service effect across um, a security realm or domain and um, and you're providing that translation so that there is a the idea that there's a central directory of translation of types and if you have it you can't do exchange without that thing that concept so it's either everybody has to agree that we all say oh no we're all going to pick that identity has this one format or you need a directory service where you register the different types and then as you say map them and so I can't, I'm not smart enough to tell you which one's going to win, but I suspect it's always going to be the, what I call the directory service model. And um, you'll, with that directory service, you'll wind up in a sense mapping these types automatically. Um, but there's really nobody writing anything about that at this point, for sure. Um, everybody still has the happy model as these providers that they're all, I'm the guy that wins the war. And it also comes down to the platforms, because in your case, probably, I'm going to assume that a big chunk of this is in, intended to be operating in a cloud environment as opposed to an on-premise environment, is my suspicion. And um, well, when you look at the cloud environments, we have the same problem. So none of this is all going to run on AWS or Azure or any of that. It's all going to come down to using something like a Kubernetes orchestration framework at a higher la layer to integrate multiple um, physical networks as well. So. There's lots of integration architecture problems that need to get resolved to make this real across a broad space. Um, and there's not, there hasn't been a lot of, you know, I, I guess, focus on that at this point for what it's worth, but it's worth paying attention yeah. to. It. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think that there's at least, again, from my perspective is the, the, the where, where we need to start in healthcare is that we need to find the highly engaged patient sets that are pushing the envelope on access to, to data and, and, and those sorts of things. And so what you find are people with significant disease states. There's a, a fairly well-known uh, patient. His name is, his, his, I'll call it performing name for lack of a better term, is E-Patient Dave. And essentially he had a condition that uh, was not a widely known or, tr or treated tr tr condition a, a number of years ago, went online and created a community and essentially has been stumping for patient access to patient records for, for a long time. And you find that with cancer patients and, and particular disease states where you have a very vocal, a small number of people, but are very vocal wanting access and wanting the ability to control their data and have access to their data. And those are the communities that are really gonna push the, the, the market to make that available. And then understanding how the, the remainder of those, the consumer side comes behind. I think that's where it gets into the, you know, who, which one's first? Is the market going to create a solution or are the consumers going to push for a solution? And then, and it's hard to know what that is, but I think if we don't make it interoperable on the backside, it's just going to be a failure like Microsoft Health Vault or, or Google Health or whatever, so. Yeah, very much so. And, and so that's a correct thing. The only other thing I'll throw in there is, yes, regulation is good, but it's also bad. And the example is CCPA, right? So what that does is definitely slows down big time. Uh, it doesn't prevent, but it does slow down and increase the cost of getting um, patient outcome data 
that's uh, shared for a, an event of whatever the type is. So, um, you know, if it's a certain type of cancer or something you're interested in, it's not that you can't, in a sense, get that data on outcome shared quickly to say, oh, look, you know, Jim, different than Michael, had a different treatment path. And look at the results for the people that followed Jim's path. It's, you know, it was, I'll call it better outcomes even at this point. Um, that kind of information is, you're right, important to share as quick as possible. And yet the, all the, what I call the privacy and identity problems, regula regulations around that certainly slow that up. So it doesn't mean that there isn't a solution to it. It just means that the, unfortunately, the time for e-patient Dave to get that stuff um, in many different communities is not as quick as it should be. Much like saying that uh, I want access to a drug that's not FDA approved yet, same issue, you know, that kind of thing. So that's a challenge for sure. Yep. No, I appreciate the conversation. Anything else? Anybody else have any other questions or anything I can answer? And again, I'm, uh, as I told Rich, is I'm pretty much an open book. So if there's any time or anything that you have a question about healthcare related or exchange, feel free to reach out. Um, but I'm always open to chat. Hey, hey, Michael, this is Erica. Um, great presentation. I really learned a lot. Um, is UC Davis Health actually participating in any consortia around blockchain or any um, research use cases currently? Not, not that I'm aware of today. There's some, there's some research folks here at UC Davis that are looking at some blockchain solutions, but there's nothing we're doing today on block on chain. Um, and I, and I can dig around some more, but it's, but I, I interact with the director for our research arm fairly regularly. And there's some graduate students that are doing some conceptual things, but there's nothing that I'm familiar with from a solution stack standpoint that we're, we're looking at. Okay. Thank you. But if you want to send me a note, I can, I can connect you with our folks, the, the right people here and they can, they can give you the real answer. I'm, I'm peripherally involved on the research side, mostly because I have access to all the Epic data or the clinical data, but I'm not day-to-day -day involved on the research side. Okay, great. Yeah, I was just asking, I'm, I work on the Health Utility Network with IBM, um, so I was just wondering if, you, if um, anyone had approached you guys um, with regard to that. But I'll, well, I'll send you, an, so, I'll take it offline. Yeah, just send me a note offline. I, I believe IBM is participating. We have a, a think tank spinning up here in Sacramento called Aggie Square. Um, and I believe IBM is a, a big partner in that, and that would be the place to possibly have that as an entree. So, but yes, hit me, send me a note offline and we can connect and I can get you with the right people. Thank you. Any other questions? Otherwise, I'll turn this back to you, Rich. Yeah, excellent. Uh, yeah, any any other questions as we, uh, we're coming up to the top of the hour, but uh, I mean, outstanding uh uh, outstanding uh, presentation. I mean, you know, really amazing, given particularly that uh, what we're looking at is sort of this interesting sort of integration of blockchain technologies into existing healthcare state. And it's, it's you know, we often sometimes forget that uh, new technologies uh, have to integrate into existing uh, technologies and frameworks and backends. Uh, and so it's really interesting to sort of get a sense from, from your perspective at UC Davis uh, Health uh, where the notion of blockchain technologies is interesting, but you know, to your point, uh, it, you know, it just it's not quite there yet. Uh, but there are, you know, there's there's some, you know, rattling of chains, uh, and so it's it'll be interesting to see how things progress going forward. Yeah, and and again, I I think um, that the conceptually is that if I have a vendor show up, again, whoever it is, if they have a built-in consortium, if they've already sold or or can show up in Sacramento and say, hey, we have these four business partners and they want to share this information. Would you like to do that? Maybe maybe it's a consideration, but if it's just a point solution for me, it's hard to see a value internally. So, Right, and I think, you know, uh, to me, the takeaway, and this is something that uh, I think, you know, both yourself and I, mean, I know David Holdings also sort of driven this point, and this is something that uh, I think we all want to sort of take away uh, from is that, you know, the value of blockchain technologies is very uh, sort of specific. It's a specific tool in a very large toolbox. And, uh, and the dem you know, the examples that you presented uh, really sort of emphasize that, which is there is common data that ought to be shared. 
uh, and blockchain, uh, particularly blockchain uh, DLT, is a great way to make that happen. Uh, but you don't dump everything onto uh, onto a DLT, and so you really have to think about you know making use of the technology to the to the best of its uh, strengths. And so that, to me, is the compelling aspect of of you know much of the much of the the thread of of discussion here regarding the the technology suite here. Yeah, for sure. I mean that that's one of the basic tenets we talked about early on is that that, that the footprint of the data on chain's got to be pretty lightweight. Um, and and at the end of the day, for me, the concept of track and trace really uh, hit home with the idea that, you know, my biggest problem in my day to day job is who had who they who a person is and where they've had care. And if I have both of those information, if, if I have that information and I lock it in. 90% of the data, 95% of the data that I want to get from another organization or somebody wants to exchange with me, I can probably do. With, t with existing, with today's existing frameworks. There's not anything right now that I'm aware of that's 100% a, a accurate on that because not everybody's connected. And that's another piece, right. is, you know, if you're not connected chain or not, <laughs> or not you're not gonna get that, that information, so. Yeah, 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 exactly. I mean, uh, you know, islands of information and the idea is to try to find a way to sort of homogenize that or, or uh, you know, I think the, the, the the reference that you made was you want longitudinal access to data, which I think is you know, the, the proper way to look at it going forward, particularly in healthcare. Okay, well, uh, again, thanks, Michael. Uh, great presentation. Um, and then as far as uh, the HTC community goes, we will be meeting again uh, in two weeks. Uh, and for people that are newer to the, uh, to the organization, uh, the, the healthcare SIG uh, meets every two weeks. So our next uh, scheduled general meeting will be uh, on uh, November 15th, 7 o'clock uh, uh, a.m., that's Pacific time. And uh, I think we're going to be uh, hosting a general meeting, which is just a sort of a status from our uh, uh, HC SIG subgroups and uh, some of our ad hoc teams. And so uh, we'll, we'll sort of bring everybody back up to speed. Uh, with some of the work that's been uh, being done in the uh, in the in the SIG specifically. Uh, any comments or questions before we sign off? Is the timing of the meeting always going to be the same every Friday? Uh, every other Friday, correct. Every other Friday, right. Yeah. But as long as the timing stays the same, that's great. Thank you. Cor yeah, exactly. Yeah, uh, seven seven o'clock in the morning. That reaches all the way across, so that we can get uh, uh, folks on the East Coast. And then I think we have a couple of folks that uh, join us from India periodically as well. Alrighty. Well, thanks everyone. Thanks again, Michael. A great presentation. And oh, by the way, uh, for folks that are interested, the uh, Mike's uh, presentation is available. Uh, you can sort of, sort of see it here. Uh, and so uh, feel free to make use of it as well. I'll be posting uh, the video uh, and that'll go out to membership a little bit later on today. Uh, and so anyone that's interested, feel free to make use of that uh, going forward as well. I didn't know I was being videoed, Rich. <laughs> I didn't sign that waiver. Oh boy! <laughs> surprise! Uh, surprise! Excellent. Well, thanks I again. Being audio, not video. I'm sorry. Go say say again, Mike. You were doing an audio recording. I didn't know you were doing a video recording. Oh, okay. <laughs> it worked great. It perfectly. All right. Well, thanks everyone, and we'll see you in two weeks. Have a great weekend. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Okay.